Okay, so what we want to do is uh, pick up our discussion with the sources of bank funds. We'll finish that up today in just a few minutes. You remember the number one source of funds for banks is deposits. What did I say? 60 to 65 percent of all the funds flowing into banks are deposits, transaction deposit, non-transaction. The second most important uh, source of funds, just dollar-wise, flowing into banks is borrowing. I talked about borrowing from other banks. What do we call that, you remember? Purchasing Fed funds. I talked about borrowing from the Fed, borrowing through the discount window. I talked just, I think, very briefly last time about borrowing from overseas banks. And this is called borrowing euro dollars. Okay, I want to talk about this a little bit, not very much, <clears throat> but dollars find their way overseas. And, for example, we might uh, purchase something from somebody, some manufacturer in Germany, and the German manufacturer may accept dollars in payment for the goods and services. And that's just a, a hypothetical. Anyway, here's what a euro dollar is. It is, maybe I ought to write this down, a dollar denominated deposit I'll say dollar-denominated bank deposit in a bank outside the U.S. Okay, so if somebody, let's say I took $1,000 and went to a bank in London and said, hey, I want to put this $1,000 into an account in your bank. And usually when we're talking about these, these are usually time deposits, but they don't have to be to satisfy the definition. But most commonly, it would be a time deposit. If I take $1,000 and I go to some bank in London, and I say, hey, I want to put $1,000 in your bank, of course, they will say, great. But then I stipulate, when I put this deposit in your bank, I'm putting in $1,000. When you give it back to me in a month or two or six or whenever it is, I want dollars back. I don't want pounds. I don't want any other currency. I want dollars back. And I want you to keep track of my balance. I want you to pay me interest. This is a dollar-denominated deposit. And they say, okay. Then those dollars in that bank account are euro dollars. That's their term. Now. The definition says outside the United States. It doesn't say in Europe. This got started in Europe. And so when it got started in Europe, it got that name, Euro dollar. But now it applies to a dollar denominated deposit in any bank outside of the United States. And so if you put dollars into a checking account or a savings account in a Japanese bank and say this is to be denominated in dollars, not in yen, and they say, okay. And then that's the way you're keeping score. They pay you back in dollars. That would be a euro dollar account, even though it's got nothing to do with Europe at this point. Okay. Now, so this is, you know, we've got dollars floating around in the United States, moving from bank to bank and, and so forth, and account to account. But what I'm telling you is those dollars are overseas and they're moving around too. And we're going to talk a little bit more about them in a mo moment, but. What I'm saying to you is this, is a bank here in the United States, a bank in this city or a bank in Chicago or New York or whatever, a bank might say, we need some money. We need some dollars. And they're taking all the deposits that come in, and they're going out and maybe borrowing from other banks, but they start saying, hey, how much would it cost us to borrow from another bank down the street or across town or across the state? How much would it cost us to purchase euro dollars? How much would it cost us interest-wise? How much would it cost us to borrow dollars that are outside the United States? Now, these banks here, when we're talking about them borrowing, they don't need to borrow yen or, or, uh, or 
pounds or some other foreign currency. They want dollars. So when they're looking for these, these overseas funds, they're looking for dollars, and they're looking for euro dollars. And there is a market with dollars in it outside the United States, and so that's where they look. Now, a couple other things to be said just generally about this market. It's a very fascinating story how this got started. Back in the uh, Cold War, about 1960, I don't know the exact year, but about in 1960, uh, a bunch of, or not a bunch, but the Soviet Union then, Russia today, the Soviet Union had some dollars deposited in New York banks, several New York banks, big banks. And then the Cold War is going on, and so then Russia starts thinking, or the Soviet leaders start thinking, hey, We've got dollars deposited in the United States in these New York banks. And there's this Cold War, there's this tension going on. Maybe the president will just say, seize those dollars. Now, this is something that the Soviets would have done, and so that's what made them think of this. Seize, the, uh, seize those dollars that belong to the Soviet Union in the New York banks. We'll take them. Don't give them back. And that was their fear. And that fear caused them to say, you know, we ought to get these dollars out of these banks. They're at risk. But then they said, we do want to hold on to dollars. We don't want some other currency. We want the dollars themselves. We just don't want to keep them in the United States where they can be seized. And so then the Soviet leadership, and they, you know, they had a financial officer, went to some big banks in Germany and said, hey, would you accept a deposit we're going to take some money out of the United States. Would you accept this deposit and pay us interest and all that kind of stuff? And the Germans said, yeah. <laughs> Let the record show that we had an outburst. So the Germans said, yeah. Okay. And so then, but the Soviets said, just a second. We don't want to just put anything in your bank. We are, let the record show, we're putting dollars in the bank. We're earning interest in dollars. We're going to take dollars out. This is a dollar-denominated deposit. And the Germans said, yeah. And so what I'm telling you is the Soviet Union, these communists at the time, are the ones that invented this paragon of capitalism this world market for dollars, the euro dollar market. And after they started doing it, then other people said, hey, that's a good idea. If we have some dollars here, I got a million bucks, I'm going to shop around, see where I can get the best interest rate. And so then they go to the New York bank or a Chicago bank or whatever and say, what interest will you charge? And then they'd start saying to some bank in London or in uh, Bonn, Germany, or you know, name it, uh, Paris, France, or Tokyo, Japan, hey, how much interest would you give us for this million dollars? And whoever offers the most, that's who gets it. Now, why would a foreign bank, why would a bank in, in Japan say, we'll accept these dollars? And the answer is, they might have a customer that wants dollars. If, let's say, some company over in Japan wants to buy computers that were manufactured in the United States, then they say, hey, we've got to pay for those computers in dollars. And we wouldn't be able to go down to our bank and get some dollars. And so then that Japanese bank might say, hey, we need some dollars to service our customers. And so there is a market around the world for dollars. Banks around the world are accepting dollars. <clears throat> and when it is denominated in dollars, regardless of what continent it's in, it's called a euro dollar. Now, after that happened, then the same idea spread. So somebody says, hey, what if I go to Germany or Japan or some other country, Mexico, and I take British pounds, that currency, and I put British pounds in, let's say, a bank in Mexico City, and that bank account is denominated in pounds. The euro pound market. See, we keep the euro on there to denote what's going on, but it would be the euro pound market if it is a pound denominated deposit in a bank outside of now England. Got it? So what would you call it if people take their currency in Europe and put it in a bank in the United States and it's denominated in their currency? What would that be? 
the euro euro market. <laughs> Not the euro dollar, the euro euro, right? <laughs> anyway, so except for that bad joke at the end. That's what I wanted you to know is this was developed by the Soviet Union about 50 years ago because they were afraid of their funds being seized. And now this is spread. And this concept is around the uh, world, this whole concept of currencies being deposited in banks in other countries. The Euro-Yen market would be Euro-Yen. It is a Yen-denominated account, of course, the Yen being Japan's currency, a Yen-denominated account in um, a country outside of Japan, in a bank in a country outside of Japan. Okay. So anyway, back to our story, bankers want to borrow. <coughs> How much did I say last time? Around 20, 25 percent, something like that. That's what I said. Around 20, 25 percent of all the funds flowing into banks, they borrow, and we're kind of talking about some examples. There are many, many examples, and I'm just going to do three or four. Um, let me do one more, and then I'll stop, because we don't want to spend all of our time just talking about this subject. Bonds and notes sold. This requires a little bit of discussion. First of all, here's what you should know. Banks can't sell bonds. So when I say bonds and notes sold, it's not that easy. If you remember what happens is, Nowadays, any bank of any size is owned by a bank holding company. Okay, and banks cannot sell bonds to attract money. And so what will happen is something like this, although it is an important source of funds for a bank, what will happen is this, the bank holding company will sell a bond. This is the bank holding company bond and then they'll bring in the dollars for that bond. And sometimes they call them notes, but it's a bond is what it is. It's, it's a longer term IOU issued by a bank holding company. So then the, the bank holding company sells a bond, and I don't mean to say a bond it's holding of some governmental agency. I mean they print up their own bonds. And they sell those bonds and get the dollars. And then what happens is, they send those dollars to the bank and take possession of some assets from the bank. Now this is all done by an accountant. There's not actually any physical movement. What they have is a headquarters and there's the bank holding company upstairs and then downstairs is the bank. And they've got an accountant. And so what will happen? In order to comply with the law, they say, hey, we cannot sell bonds. We, the bank. We can't sell bonds, so, but we need some funds. What are we going to do? And the answer, we'll have the bank holding company print some bonds up, sell those, generate some funds, and then the bank holding company will give us the funds. Well, they can't give it to us. It's a separate company. So what they'll do is the bank holding company will transfer those funds to us, and we will, quote, sell them some assets, meaning we'll transfer ownership of those assets. If the bank ever needs those assets back, specific assets, then they'll get them back and hand over different assets. And this can be done, you know, with the stroke of a pen, actually with the touch of a keyboard. So it's not a problem to do. In effect, though, it is as though the bank could sell bonds and notes. It's really an obligation of the bank holding company, but any time the bank needs funds, it can say to the bank holding company, boy, we need some funds. Why don't you sell $100 million worth of notes? And the bank holding company says, okay, because it's all run by the same people. Are you with me? Now, there are other possibilities, like I say, of borrowing. This is enough for us to go through uh, for the time being. Uh, another possibility would be just, uh, and when I said other banks, I was talking about the, uh, what, Fed funds market. Uh, there would be another possibility, uh, maybe a longer term bank loan. not the Fed funds market, just go to another bank and say, hey, would you lend us $100 million for two years or something like that, or two months? 
okay? And it kind of depends on the nature of it. There are just some bank loans, and sometimes there's something called a term Fed funds transaction, and it has a longer term, but like a month or something like that. Anyway, I'm just saying to you that borrowing, that happens pretty often. Banks cannot, the, the passive banks that are not real active can just sit back and take the deposits and not worry too much about the rest. But these um, regional banks and the money center banks, they do not sit back and say, well, whatever came in, that's good enough. They're always saying, you know, if you remember, I had that little picture up here. I showed, here's the bank. Dollars are coming in. Dollars are going out. And I said, they pay interest, pay interest, and then they charge interest, right? And if maybe this is 3% and this is 7%, these big, aggressive banks are saying, hey, every time a dollar goes through here and we pay 3 and we charge 7 we came out with, you remember the term, the net interest margin of 4%. What we need to do is have more dollars come through. If you have, let's say, $100 million go through the bank, $100 million is our source of funds, $100 million we put to use, we pay 3%, we charge 7 and $100 million through, the net interest margin of 4% of $100 million, that's $4 million bucks. We've got four million bucks to pay the employees, to pay the rent, to heat the building, turn the lights on, and so forth. We got four percent of a hundred million dollars. Well, gosh, what if we had a billion dollars? We'd have four percent of a billion. That's 40 million. And so these aggressive banks are saying, well, hey, I get the idea. It's four percent of however many dollars goes through. Let's get more dollars. Four percent of a hundred billion dollars would be, hey, that's four billion dollars. 4% of a trillion dollars, $40 billion. Hey, we want to be as big as we can. And so what I'm saying to you is that, hey, we want to be as big as we can to make this net interest margin concept work with us, or for us, then they're not content to just sit back and say, well, whatever deposits come in, that's, that's it. They say, let's go get some more money. Let's find it. You got any money for us? And they're very aggressive. Money center banks, the most aggressive. But then the large regional banks are very aggressive. And so they don't stop with deposits. They borrow. The third source of funds for banks is the capital accounts. Capital, I'm going to say from owners. And this is if you've been keeping score, around 10 to 12 percent of total funds. It depends on the banks that we're looking at. The most aggressive banks like this to be small. 10 or 12 percent of total funds coming into the banks come from owners. <clears throat> now, the term of leverage is something that I don't think we've really talked about, but the idea of leverage is this, using other people's money to run your business, not your own. And so what we're saying here is that banks are using about 88 to 90 percent of all the funds they are using belongs to somebody else. And they're not using much of their own funds. And this is a financial company. It's set up that way. If you had, <coughs> excuse me, if you had a manufacturing company that had this kind of a situation where the, about 90% of all the dollars coming in belong to somebody else, and we'll pay you back, we'll pay you back, that company would get in trouble before very long to be broke. But that is not such a problem. 10% for a capital asset ratio. Let me kind of do a little erasing. I'm going to use a term here. All these dollars come into banks. The banks put those dollars to use, and we're going to start talking in a moment. But these are all assets of banks. 
You know, they get the dollars, and as long as they're holding them, that's an asset right now. We've got dollars. But then they put those assets to work. But the source of all these, if you brought in $65 here, and you brought in $25 here, and brought in $10 here, you'd have $100, and that'd be your total assets of $100. Okay, and so in this particular case, what we would do is say, oh, would they have a capital to asset ratio of, here would be 10 over 100, equals 10%. And so I'm saying to you that the capital asset ratio for banking in recent years has been around 10 or 12 percent. And I use this 10 percent just to do a calculation. Okay. And what I'm saying to you is that 90 percent leverage or 90 percent using other people's money and 10 percent your own, that will not work in most businesses. But in financial businesses, this is the nature of the business, is to use other people's money and put it to work. Now, where do they get this capital? Let's say this little group here, and those of you at home, let's say that we wanted to start our own bank. Then what we'd do is we'd all talk about it a little bit, and we'd say, hey, let's put some money together and start a bank, start a company, a banking company. Okay, okay, here's somebody say, I'll put in $500, somebody else $2,000, and so forth. And we would gather up all of our investments in that bank and that's how we would get our start with capital is from us, right? We, the investors, would put our funds together. And so then we would get shares of stock. If I put in $2,000 into our banking company and you put in $500, then you'd have just one-fourth as much ownership as I do in the bank, one-fourth as many shares. So on that day one, when we're just going to open our bank up, we owners are going to put some money in. Actually, we're going to be there first with money. There's not going to be deposits when we first open. We've got to open our doors and accept deposits. Nobody will loan money to our bank. We don't even have a bank until we put some money of ours in it. So the first dollars coming in are from the owners. And that's when issues of stock are sent out. And so this would be called the IPO, the initial public offering for our new banking company. And so that's when we would receive stock and provide capital to the bank. Okay? And that's where this starts off. And we will come back later and talk about bank regulation, but the regulators tell us this. If you want a charter to do business, you have got to have a capital asset ratio of around 10 or 12 percent. You've got to have that. And that, and a minimum of $50,000, that'd be a tiny little bank. Let's say you had $50,000 to start your bank as capital, and you know, oh, we've got $50,000, and we're going to have a capital asset ratio of 10 percent then what we would have to say is we cannot have assets of more than $500,000, right? Then we'd have that capital asset ratio. But if we set, open the doors and we've invested 50,000 bucks and we open the doors and somebody comes in and says, hey, I'm glad to see a new bank, here's a million bucks. Then we'd say, holy mackerel, we just got a million dollars deposited. We got a million dollars and really 50,000. We've got a million dollars in assets our capital asset ratio is only 50,000 divided by a million, 5%. Uh-oh, we're in violation. So real quick, we got two choices. Are we going to turn away some of that money, or are we going to find other money from investors? Now, it might be easy to find other money from investors. We say, hey, look at this first day, a million dollars came in. Other investors say, wow, this is great. I want to be part of the action. But. Nevertheless, what I'm saying to you is that bank cannot grow too fast. It can't grow faster than what the owners can put into the bank as, and it's not putting it in as a deposit. We hand that money over to the bank, and the bank says, thank you, the management does, thank you, owners. That money's gone. You're never going to get it back. But you do have stock, and you can sell your stock, but this money is not for you to get back. You're an owner of the bank now. This is not a deposit. If you want it back, 
I'll tell you what we do. You go around front, come on in up to the teller, slide some cash across the, the desk. We'll take that and we'll owe it to you and give it back to you whenever you want. But if you're going to be an owner, you give us that money, we give you shares of stock, you hold the stock or you sell the stock, but don't come back to us and ask us for money. We don't give that to owners. You with me on this? So that's the number one place that banks get capital. And I say number one, not the most important, but the first place is from the owners when we're starting our business up. Periodically, we could come back to owners and say, hey, you know, business is going good. We'd like to have some more investment from you all. And the reason you should do this is business is going good. And we can't grow anymore. We can't get any bigger if we don't have more capital. We've got to have this capital asset ratio of 10%. And if we want to just keep taking in deposits, and boy, business is good, for us to grow and just keep on taking deposits and accumulating more and more assets, we've got to have more capital. You want to do this? You've got two choices. Hand me some more uh, capital, more investment, or say no, but we authorize, well, I guess you have three choices. One is hand over more capital out of your own pocket. A second one would be Turn away business. Now we're not growing. This is big enough. And, and bankers do not like to do that. And the third one is to say, go out and find some other owners. Go out and sell some more stock. Issue some more shares. And get more investors. So anyway, getting investments from investors, that is the first place, but it's not the biggest. Here's the biggest source of bank capital. It's after the business is going for a while. And we're taking in deposits and paying 3% or 2% or whatever. We're taking in deposits and we're making loans and we're charging 7%. And now we've got a profit at the end of the year. Oh, profits. What do you do with profit? Three choices. This is every company. Three choices on what you do with profit. First of all, pay your taxes because there's corporate income tax. So you pay your taxes and then you get some profit left over. And now you've got a choice. Pay a dividend to the owners or retain those dividends. And so if you need more capital in that bank to continue growing, what you say is, hey, and this will be an example, hey, we earn $10 million in profit. We'll pay, let's say, $3 million in taxes. We've got $7 million after taxes. Rather than hand you $7 million, you owners, we're going to give you $2 million dividends and we're going to keep the remaining $5 million and add to capital. And so it would be retained earnings. And that would be, in terms, uh, that's the second, because, second in time, but it's number one in size. This is where most banks get their capital, is they earn a profit and they don't hand it all out as dividends. They retain some of that. And then over time, and what they say to the owners is, look, yeah, it's true that after taxes we have $7 million in profits. We're taking $5 million of your money and putting it back in this bank so we can grow. And if we've got another $5 million, that would go in the numerator here, then with the 10% capital asset ratio, another $5 million would allow our bank to grow another $50 million in size. And so over time, we've got to keep on getting some money. We can't over leverage this. We're not going to have more than 90%, let's say, of all the funds that we've got to use. We're not going to have more than 90% come from other people. 10% are going to come from you, or 12 or something in that neighborhood. The more aggressive banks will make a a smaller number. Now, here's what's important about capital, and capital is very important. Here's what's important is, and we'll come back and talk about this side of the operation later, but you put these assets to work, you've got dollars coming in, there's deposits coming in, there's borrowing, there's some money from owners. Let's say we've got a hundred dollars, and we put that to work, and we make a big deal is loans. And let's say we make $75 worth of loans out of this $100 coming in. Then you know there are times when the economy is kind of weak or sometimes when we make poor decisions. 
And so suppose you own that $75 out and some of those, or 75 million if you like, or 75 billion if you like, but you own that out and then some borrowers come back and say, I just can't pay you. Now, not all the borrowers say that, but some. And let's say that $5 or $5 million or $5 billion, $5 go bad, bad loans, and we're not going to be able to collect those. And so we had to write off those $5 million worth of bad loans or $5 billion or whatever the number would be. And now all these assets are over here, and it was, it was $100 in assets, 75 of which was loans. But now we just made some bad loans. We've got $70 worth of loans now that we wrote some off. And now we don't have $100 in assets. How much do we have? 95. And now we turn back to these folks on the other side of, the, of our operation, and we say, hmm, we had $100 coming in, and we put that $100 to work, but we lost five. And now we have to turn back to this side over here and say, we no longer have 100. Somebody over here is going to be disappointed. Well, we can't disappoint the depositors. We promised them. We got a contract with them. You put a, you know, a dollar in the bank, you get a dollar back, plus interest. That's your contract. And, we, and if we don't honor that, then our regulators come down and say, oh, you want us to take your charter away and just shut you down? No, 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 no. Well, then you pay those depositors like you promised. And then we borrowed some money. And we turned to them and we say, huh, we lost some money, got bad news for you. Maybe we won't pay you back. And the lenders say, is that right? Do you want to just stop borrowing altogether? Because if you don't pay us off, just like you promised, we got a contract with you, then who's going to ever lend to you in the future because you don't pay your loans off? And so if you try to back out on, you say, $5 on this, then the other 20 go away because they go, no, we're not doing business with you. You're getting ready to cheat us too. No, no, we can't do that. We'll never be able to borrow again. So then we say, gosh, we're going to have to disappoint somebody over here, not the depositors, not the lenders, owners. And then they say to the owners, hey, you, you know how you gave us that $10? Yeah. Well, we lost five. And boy, let me tell you, those owners are not happy. But, by the way, where were we here? Now this is five. They're not happy, but the bank is still in business. There's still some capital there. And so what happened was, this is kind of like a shock absorber. We can have some bad news, and the bank's still in business. Let's say what happened was this. We make all these loans, and we have bad loans of 15. And our total assets are 85. And we say, we got to disappoint somebody. And then we go over there and say, hey, we got $10 from the owners. We got to disappoint you by $15. <laughs> now, this is negative, less than zero. There is no capital. And guess what else there is no? There is no bank. This is bankrupt. This is when the capital accounts fall into negative territory, zero or negative. That means you're broke. And that means you say, whoops, and they call in the regulators, the FDIC and the Federal Reserve and the bank chartering authorities, whether it's a state chartering agency or the national or the controller of the currency. We say, you know what? We're out of capital. We've wiped the owners out. Close the doors. Now, so what I'm saying to you is there can always be bad news. And the more capital there is, the more bad news we can stand without closing the bank. Suppose this had been 20 to begin with. I'm going to put a 20 up here. If this had been 20, and this had been, I don't know, let's make this uh, 60 and this 20. So 60% in deposits, 60% or 20% borrowing, and then 20 in capital. We have this setback. Oh, bad loans. Would this be 60? Bad loans, 15. Oh my gosh, that's a lot. That's huge, by the way, in real life. 
That's a lot. We turn to the owners and say, bad news, and they say, we are really unhappy with you, but we're still in business. So what we're going to do, we owners, we're going to go ahead with our business. We're just going to do it under new management. You're fired. Clean out your desk. And take everybody with you that you've hired, all the vice presidents, just get out of here. But we're still in business. And so the larger that capital asset ratio is, the safer this bank is and the less likely to go out of business. And so the regulators, the regulators are trying to make our banking industry safe. They're saying, we want this to be big. Now, the only thing is, and the owners want this to be big at a time of crisis. But when there's no crisis, when things are going good, and we're not writing many of these loans off, we say, oh, we'll write off like 15 cents or something like that. Then what the owners are thinking is this. Yeah, this is safe. Wouldn't it be nice if we only had $5 in capital and a 5% capital asset ratio? Because then we'd be generating this profit, this net interest margin. We'd be generating that same profit. If we're using somebody else's money, not our own, we'd be generating the same profit, but on a very small investment of ours. And then our rate of return would be high. If we had $100 coming in from all sources and just five of ours and 95 of other people's, that same profit we were earning a second ago divided by our small investment means high rate of return. Ooh, that's great. And so what's happening is there's this tension. And the tension is the bank owners want to be heavily leveraged and use other people's money. If they could, during good times, they would invest $1, 50 cents, 25 cents, Two cents, one cent. They want to invest as little as possible and use everybody else's money to generate a profit. And then that way they have a very big rate of return on their little bitty investment. And that's called success. And that's during good times. And, and if times are always going to be good, the regulators wouldn't mind that either. But times aren't always going to be good. And the regulators say, this is going to turn around one of these days. One of these days, there's going to be a recession, or your local economy is going to get in trouble, or you're going to have a big borrower, somebody who's a really great customer that's borrowed a lot of money from you, and they'll just have trouble in their business. Competition will come along and put them out of business, and they won't pay you back. And if you have almost no capital, a little bit of bad news, you're going to be wiped out. That bank's going to fail. So that's the tension. You've got the tension between the regulators and the bank investors and the regulators want a high capital investment ratio because they want safety there. And the investors want a small capital asset ratio because they want a high rate of return. And then, when there is bad news, we've got a different kind of tension. When there is bad news, and we're writing these off, or need to write them off, a new form of tension develops. Because when we're writing these off, then the managers, the president, turns to the shareholders and said, I lost your money, and the shareholders say, clean your desk out. And so the tension is, the guy who's running this bank, or it could be a gal, but anyway, the, the manager of this bank does not want to tell those investors, I lost your money, even though it's lost. They say, oh my, when I deliver this bad news, they're going to have my scalp. So what do we do? And the answer is, what we do is we, I mean, here's what I advise. Be honest, tell the truth. But what is done in real life? It might be something like this. A borrower comes to you, you're the manager, and you say, oh, how are you doing today? And the borrower says, you know, I'm having some trouble. I can't pay on these loans. Is that right? Ooh, you borrowed a lot from us, too. What are we going to do? And the banker's thinking, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? And here's what sometimes happens. The, bar, uh, the manager says, hmm, I see you're behind, let's say, $2 million. What if I just lend you $3 million? Would you be able to make that payment on that loan? And the borrower says, well, yes, I could. And so the banker says, okay, here you go. Here's $3 million. 
and now the borrower says, I've got $3 million. I can pay you that $2 million I owe you. Okay, we don't have any overdue loans. Everything's great. Really? Now that guy got $3 million. That guy can't pay two? Now he's got three. But we don't have to tell the owners that anything's wrong. Until, you know, like next year, and they come in and say, oh, you know, I owe you $3 million. I'm having trouble. Well, what if I loan you $4 million? Would you have trouble? No, no, then I could do it. So what I'm telling you is this, is when there is bad news, then the management, there's a new conflict, it's between the management and the owners. And the management would rather this not come out. And the owners want to know. Here's why they want to know. Hey, I got somebody working for me that's giving my money away. They don't mean to give it away. They mean to make a loan and then get it back. But if you don't get it back, it's giving it away. And the owner's thinking, hey, I got somebody, if they had full information, they have asymmetric information, they say, hey, if I knew this bank manager was giving my money away and not getting it back, I'd get rid of that manager. And so these people want to know the truth, the shareholders, as soon as possible. And the bank management says, well, let's don't rush to judgment. Things could turn around. If there were great times, then this guy I'm owning all this money to, this guy will start selling stuff. He'll have money. He can pay me off. It's just a matter of time. The economy will turn around. Let's don't get all excited. And these people are saying, oh, yeah, okay, okay. Then what? Next year, oh, I'll loan you $5 million so you can pay me four. Next year, I'll loan you $6 million so you can pay me five. You know, there's only 10 here to start. Next year, I'll loan you $7 million so you can pay me six. We're going to get to a point where this bank's out of business because they don't just do that with one. It's like every time you've got a big borrower come in with problems, you go, oh, let me help you out. Now, I am not saying that's legal. I'm not saying it's encouraged. I'm saying it happens. Not every time, sometimes. But when we find these banks that close down and these numbers, you know, the capital goes from 10 to 9 to 8 to minus 14, then they start looking and say, hey, how could that have gone from 10 to 9 to 8 to minus 14? And the answer is, well, because this kind of stuff's been going on and we didn't uncover it until just now. And so the new tension that develops is, the first tension you remember was, the shareholders don't want to invest much. They want to use other people's money. And the regulators say, no, 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 we want you to have a high capital asset ratio. So the owners and the regulators are kind of on different sides to begin with. They're in normal times. And now in bad times, what happens is the regulators want to find out the truth, how bad is the situation, so we can do something about it as soon as possible before this goes to minus 14. And so do the owners want to do that. And they're on the same side. And then the management's on the other side going, don't worry about that. Leave that in our hand. We're professional bankers. So kind of interesting the way this comes out, but sometimes these situations go from eh, not so hot to horrible in a very short period of time. How could that have happened? And the answer is very often it happened because all the truth was not known before it went terrible, and then all of a sudden the truth came out. Okay. And again, that's a different form of asymmetric information. That is asymmetric information between the management and the owners. Okay, any questions about this before we go on? Let me mention a couple other things and then that'll be it on this. If we go back 20 years ago, this capital asset ratio is more like 6, 7%, right? The banks would be using, let's say, 92, 93% of other people's money, and then 6, 7% of their own, of the shareholders' money. Then what happened was, in the early 1980s, we went through a period of lots and lots of bank failures. And it was not only happening here, but it was happening overseas. And then, the bank regulators in this country, and I mean the federal regulators, the Federal Reserve and the controller of the currency, and the FDIC, they got together and talked among themselves. Then they talked to regulators overseas, and they said, you know what? We have just not been operating with enough capital in our banks. And so there was a, an agreement between the United States regulators and the foreign regulators to make this ratio go up. And so it got in the neighborhood of 10%. 
I think we're going to see that go up some more. We've had a lot of trouble uh, over the last few years in the banking industry and a lot of failures. And so I think we're going to see the regulators say, you know, we needed more capital. I think they're going to say that for the biggest banks, we need more capital. Because the biggest banks are the ones that if they fail, they don't just fail and go out of business, but they, have a, uh, they basically impose risks on the entire economy. And so we could stand it if small banks don't have a lot of capital and a small bank goes out of business. We say, well, that's unfortunate. We don't like to see it, but we can clean up the mess. But if a bank with a trillion dollars in asset goes out of business, then we maybe can't clean that up very easily. And so higher capital asset ratio. Okay. Anyway, what we'll do next time, I see we've come to the end of the, uh, of the hour. What we're going to do next time is we'll talk about these assets and there are four different categories of assets, and um, then we'll move on. So long. See you next time.